This program is brought to you by the partners and friends of Creflo Dollar Ministries. Coming up next on Changing Your World. He saved me. He reconciled me. He made me righteous. He made me sanctified. He made me holy. He died for me. He went to hell for me. He got up on the third day. He is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty, and he's coming back again. And until then, I am going to behold him. I'm sticking with him. There is a purpose for your life. Introducing Grace Life Academy, an innovative approach to learning God's Word. Grace Life Academy offers unlimited access with hundreds of hours of online teachings. You'll have access to comprehensive video Bible lessons that include features such as e-courses, study guides, an online community, quizzes, and more. Text GLA to 51555 or go online to MyGraceLifeAcademy.com. chapter 9 and verse 2. And just if you would allow me, let's, uh, let's go through this and, and, and allow God to reveal some things to us just here in this illustration in Mark chapter 9 and verse 2. All right, now watch very carefully. He says, And after six days Jesus taketh with him Peter, James, and John. Now, it was very significant, not, not by mistake. He specifically wanted Peter, James, and John. And he leadeth them up into a high mountain apart from them, themselves, and he was transfigured before them. So Jesus leads them up to a high mountain. He's transfigured before them. And his raiment or his clothes became shining, exceeding white as snow, so as no fuller on earth uh, can whiten them. And there appeared unto them Elijah with Moses, and they were talking to Jesus. So Peter, James, and John went up to this mountain with Jesus, and Jesus was transfigured, and he, he was, uh, appeared with Moses, and Elijah. Verse 5, And Peter answered and said to Jesus, Master, it is good for us to be here. And let us make, the, let us make three tabernacles, one for thee, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. I'm sure it was good to be there. Oh, man. And look at verse 6. For he went not what to say, for they were so afraid. And there was a cloud that overshadowed them, and a voice came out of the cloud saying, This is my beloved son, hear him. And suddenly, when they had looked round about, they saw no man anymore except Jesus only with them. Wow. So, what was going on here? I, I would read this as, as a young Christian, and I thought it was pretty amazing. Uh, that you would get an opportunity to behold that. So I could really relate to them when they said, oh, it was good to be here. But there was so much more going on here. Uh, for example, you know, uh, Moses appeared. Well, what does Moses represent? Moses represents the law. And then Elijah appeared. Well, what did Elijah represent? Elijah represented the prophets. And then Jesus was there with them, and what did Jesus represent? Jesus represented grace and truth. Notice what, what, what they saw, Peter, Peter and, and, and James and John. They saw Moses' law. They saw Elijah, prophets. They saw Jesus, grace and truth. So, on the mountain of transfiguration, 
you have a representation of law, of prophets, of grace and truth. So two disappeared, and they saw no man only but Jesus. And a voice said, hear him. So now look at this. Peter, Peter represented stone. James represented replace. John represented grace. What was he saying here? He said, stone replaced by grace. Grace replaced stone. In other words, we're not under the law anymore, praise God. He says the grace of God has replaced the stone. The law was written on stone. The grace of God replaced the stone. Elijah and Moses disappeared, and the, and, and the Bible says a cloud was, was over them, and a voice said, hear him. He says you don't need the law to direct your life anymore. You don't need the, the, the prophet's ministry as it was in Elijah's day to direct your life anymore. He says, hear him. Behold Jesus, praise God. Don't behold the law anymore, praise God. Behold Jesus, praise the Lord. Grace replaced stone. And that's what he was meant. Jesus has replaced that. Look at him. Hear ye him. Praise God. Behold him. Be transformed by him. Be transfigured by him. Praise God. Now, look at Hebrews chapter 12, verse 14 through 15. Because I'm telling you right now, if, if we don't have Jesus, we don't have holiness. There's just no way it can happen. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 14 through 15, he says, follow peace with all men and holiness. Follow peace and follow ho holiness. But here's what he said, without which no man shall see the Lord. All right, here's what you got to understand. If you don't see Jesus, you're not going to follow peace or holiness because the only way you're going to follow holiness is you're going to have to see Jesus. Only way you're going to you're going to have to see Jesus. You follow peace and holiness by seeing Jesus. And then he says, looking diligently, lest any man fail of the grace of God fail of the grace of God, lest any root of bitterness springing up trouble you, and thereby many be defiled. So, he's like, you got to look diligently unless, uh, unless, uh, uh, unless, you, uh, unless you find yourself falling from the grace of God, and then if you're not looking diligently at Jesus, you're probably going to be looking at yourself, and when you look at yourself, bitterness is going to be the result. Bitterness is the result of self-centeredness. Bitterness is what happens when you're so centered on yourself and, you're not, and Jesus is not the center of your life. I'm telling you. And so, in Jesus' name, we want to focus in on him. You see, the glory of the law frightened people, but the glory of grace attract, attracts people. Let me say that again. The glory of the law frightened people. But the glory of grace attracts people. So, God's way of deliverance is to take your eyes off yourself and get it on Him. Take your eyes off yourself and get it on Him. Take your eyes off your problem. Take your eyes off your pain. Take your eyes off your hurt. Get your focus on Him. Get your eyes on Him. This is how He plans on delivering you from all the things you need to be delivered from, delivering you from the world. Look at this, uh, Numbers chapter 21, and I think verses 5 through 9. This is the key to deliverance. The key to all deliverance, I believe, is to get your eyes off yourself and to get it on Jesus. The key to all deliverance. So, in, in, what, in what areas of your life are you in need of deliverance? Get your eyes off yourself. Get your eyes on him. I believe that the key to all deliverance is operating like this. Look at what he said, verse 5 through 9. Old Testament illustration, he says, And the people spake against God and against Moses. Wherefore have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? I mean, man, their eyes are on self. For there is no bread, and neither is there any water, 
and our souls loathed this, this, this light bread. We tied the light bread. And the Lord sent fiery serpents among the people, and they bit the people, and much people of Israel died. Therefore, the people came to Moses and said, We have sinned, for we have spoken against the Lord and against thee. Pray unto the Lord that he take away the serpents from us. They're needing deliverance, right? And then Moses prayed for the people. And look what happened. And the Lord said unto Moses, Make thee a fiery serpent, set it upon a pole, and it shall come to pass that every one that is bitten, when he looketh upon it, shall live. So there's a serpent out of brass, put it on a pole, and when they focus in on that, then they'll be healed. And I'm thinking, what, God, a serpent on the pole? What did that represent? Well, that represent, uh, represented a Jesus who had taken on upon himself the sins of the world. He, all that Jesus has taken, everybody's grotesque sins is now on Jesus hanging on that cross. And you know what he says? He says, yeah, I know y'all got a lot of issues, but you're not going to get delivered paying attention to yourself. And so if you want deliverance, you're going to have to look at him. You got to look at him. And I tell you, in the name of Jesus, anytime you start getting selfish, I tell you, you need to look at Jesus on that cross. You need to recognize, man, he took upon all of your sins. You ain't got nothing to complain about. He's taken upon the sins of the whole world. You don't have anything to complain about. And to begin to focus on you and, 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 and look at what's going on in your life, I'm telling you, real deliverance, the key from real deliverance is when you stop looking at yourself, and start looking at him. You see, holiness does not consist of our feelings. It does not consist of our experiences. It consists of us beholding Christ. That's what it is. Beholding Christ, looking at Christ. That's what it consists of, which means preachers, we got to preach it. We got to read about it. We got to tell people about it. We got to put him up maybe not on a pole again, but we got to set him up so people can see him because that's where holiness consists of, seeing him. Let me show you something, another interesting illustration in the Bible, Matthew chapter 14, verse 22. And uh, just see what happens when you're beholding him. I, I believe as you behold Jesus, you, you, you'll be transferred into the supernatural. I believe supernatural things happen as you behold Jesus. Look at this illustration here. Uh, he says, in straightway, Jesus constrained his disciples to get into a ship and to go before him unto the other side while he sent the multitude away. 23, we're going to read on down. He, 23, he says, and when he had sent the multitude away, he went up into a mountain apart to pray. And when the evening was come, he was there alone. But the ship was now in the midst of the sea, tossed with waves, for the wind was contrary. Sounds like they're in a tremendous storm, maybe even a hurricane. And in the fourth watch of the night, Jesus went unto them, walking on the sea. Check that out. And when, he, when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were troubled, saying, it is a spirit, or that word's translated phantom or ghost, and they thought it was a ghost walking on the water. And they cried out for fear because they thought that was a ghost walking on the water. But straightway Jesus spake unto them, saying, Be of good cheer, it is I, be not afraid. He goes on, he says, And Peter answered him and said, Lord, if it be thou, check Peter out. He says, I hear what you're saying, but if it be thou, then bid me to come unto thee on the water. I mean, he put Jesus kind of, kind of put, it, put, it, put his back to the wall, if it be thou. I mean, what was Jesus supposed to say? Uh, you know, it, it, it be me or it be not me or it, it was Jesus. But Peter said, if it is you, then bid me to come on the water. Now watch this very carefully. And Jesus said, come. And when Peter was come down out of the ship, he walked on the water to go to Jesus. 
Now, that's powerful. That's, that's, he got out of the ship and he started walking in the supernatural. Here's Jesus there. I don't know, I don't know too many, I, I don't know but two men that walked on the water, Jesus and here's Peter walking on the water. Uh, I tried it. It's a rough thing to do. And I'm telling you right now, something supernatural happened because Jesus was there and Peter was beholding him. Now, watch this. Uh, and he said, come, and, and he came, and he walked on, on the water to, to go to Jesus, verse 30. But when he saw the wind, boisterous, he was afraid. And beginning to sink, he cried out, saying, Lord, save me, when he saw the wind. So I, I, I'm convinced that, that the wind uh, and the waves stole his focus. But as long as he was looking at Jesus, uh, the, he went from the natural to the supernatural. Why? Because he was beholding Jesus. He went from the natural to the supernatural because he was beholding Jesus. As he saw the Lord, he became as the Lord. Oh, my God. As he saw the Lord, he became as the Lord. He began to be able to do what the Lord was able to do. But when he took his eyes off of Jesus, he was no more supernatural. But when his eyes were on Jesus, he was supernatural. He's now natural, and natural men can't walk on water. So why, why did you doubt, or why did you take your eyes off Jesus? He said in verse 31, go back there in verse 31, he says, And immediately Jesus stretched forth his hands, called him, said unto him, O thou of little faith, wherefore did thou doubt? In other words, he says, why is it that your faith didn't last long enough? A uh, little faith is a short burst of faith. Why, why, why did your faith, why, why didn't you allow your faith to endure longer? Uh, and, and the Bible says, wherefore did you doubt? Something keeps you from doubt, and something keeps your faith continuing to work when you keep your focus on Jesus. And I'm telling you, there are so many things going on in the world today trying to get your focus off of Jesus. There have been people that are cursing Jesus and saying that's just the blue-eyed Jesus. And anything they can do to try to get your focus off Jesus. Because when you're not looking at Jesus and when you're not beholding Jesus, you're not going to walk in the supernatural. When you're not looking at Jesus and when you're not beholding Jesus, you're not going to walk in holiness and wholeness. When you're sick, behold Jesus so you can walk in that wholeness. When you're broke, behold Jesus so you can walk in wholeness. How do I do that? By beholding Jesus. And I'm saying to some of you right now, get your focus back on Jesus. Start beholding him and allowing the Holy Spirit to transform you into that same image. Peter saw a supernatural Jesus walking on water, and he became supernatural just like what he began to behold. I believe that same thing is true today. I believe the only reason that a lot of us have not gone crazy is because we've kept our eyes on Jesus, that we behold Jesus. And I tell you, I'm committed to preaching Jesus, praise God. He saved me. He reconciled me. He made me righteous. He made me sanctified. He made me holy. He died for me. He went to hell for me. He got up on the third day. He is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty, and he's coming back again. And until then, I am going to behold him. I'm sticking with him. Amen. Some people teach that you are responsible for keeping yourself from falling. No, Jude said, in the book of Jude, he says, now unto him who's able to keep you from falling. Oh, you got to get that. I, I, I'm not accepting the responsibility for me falling. Now unto him who's able to keep me from falling. I'm, I'm beholding him, and as I behold him, he will keep me from falling. It's pretty hard to do stupid things when you're beholding Jesus. 
it's pretty hard to continue to snort cocaine and, 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 and do stupid things. And, and it's, it's hard to do that when you're beholding Jesus. It's hard to hate when you're beholding Jesus. Amen. Now unto him who is able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless before the almighty God be glory and majesty and dominion and power. Did you, did you hear that? At the side of the book of Jude. Unto him who's able to keep me from falling. Unto him who's able to present me faultless before the almighty God. Oh, glory to God. That just does something to me to think just by beholding him, he accepts a responsibility for, for keeping me from falling. And he accepts the responsibility for presenting me faultless before the almighty God. Amen. Amen. Amen and amen. So the question is, where's the focus? The focus is on Jesus, not you. The focus is on Jesus Christ, not you. Look at 2 Chronicles chapter 20 and verse 12. 2 Chronicles chapter 20 and, and verse 12. This, is, this, this could be so life-changing if you will begin to walk in it. If, if this, you know, this has got to go beyond a, you know, a, a cute little teaching or, oh, that was, that was powerful. It, it's got to get to the place where it really ministers to you. Second Chronicles chapter 20 and verse 12. It's got to get to the place where it really ministers to you. Now, look what he says here. O oh, our God, will thou not judge them? For we have no might against this great company that cometh against us. Neither know we what to do, but our eyes are upon thee. Second Chronicles 20, man, everybody and their mama seemed like they were getting ready to try to attack. And they said, here's what we know to do. We're going to get our eyes on you. We're going to start beholding you. Man, they sent the praisers and the singers down there to the, to the battle uh, line, and they began to praise God, and they began to dance and sing that the Lord is good and his mercy endure forever, and the glory of the Lord set an ambushment on those armies. What were they doing? They were beholding him. You got to understand a lot of problems and troubles in your life. It's designed to steal your focus. It's, it's designed to get you to give more attention to your problems around you so that you're not focusing in on Jesus. That's why the book of Proverbs says, attend to my word. Give attention to my word. And when you give attention to the Word, you're beholding the right thing. You're looking at Jesus. And, and I'm telling you, that is the thing we have to mature in. We've got to become mature enough to understand that, yes, there, there are hard times going on and weird things happening, but I'm going to still keep my eyes on Jesus. And that's just not what's, what's happening right now. We, again, we want to revolve around the world instead of the world revolving around us, and we get to looking at the world instead of looking at Jesus. And I'm going to look at Jesus. I'm going to look at Jesus in the middle of a pandemic. I'm going to look at Jesus in the middle of, of, of racial injustice. I'm going to look at Jesus in the middle of a loss of jobs. I'm going to look at Jesus in the middle of people dying of COVID-19. I'm going to look at Jesus. Dear God, I have to because if I look away from him, I might lose my mind. I'm going to look at Jesus so he can keep me in the supernatural. And I'm asking you to get your focus back right. Look at Jesus. Look at Jesus, praise God. In his new three-message series, Grace-Based Holiness, Creflo Dollar challenges religion and reveals what holiness is really about. Get all three life-changing messages and the notes to take your study to a new level.
combo today. There is a purpose for your life and you are meant to do great things. Now is the time for you to take charge of your life and move towards your purpose. The key to reaching your destiny is to grow in your understanding of God's grace. Introducing Grace Life Academy, an innovative approach to learning God's Word. Grace Life Academy offers unlimited access with hundreds of hours of online teachings from Creflo Dollar. You'll have access to comprehensive video Bible lessons that include features such as e-courses, study guides, an online community, quizzes, and more. In as little as 15 minutes a day, you can study God's Word, be encouraged, and learn how to study the Bible, how to overcome fear, how to better your relationships, and so much more. Now is the time for you to take control of your life and join Grace Life Academy. Text GLA to 51555 to get started right now or go online to MyGraceLifeAcademy.com. For those of you who Because of you, Creflo Dollar Ministries is providing a new understanding of grace and empowering change in the lives of millions of people every day. Thank you, partners and friends. Your love and financial support makes it possible to bring this message into millions of homes all across the globe.